As the COVID-19 pandemic rages on in most parts of the world, how are Agilists finding meaning and purpose in these troubled times? How can we connect, inspire, and support each other? In days gone by, Karen Sarai's provided rest, recovery, and community for travelers along the ancient Silk Road. Similarly, we hope that our own Agile Karen Sarai episodes will provide rest, inspiration, and hope. We hope that each episode will remind us of our shared Agile values and thus bring us closer together. In past episodes, we've heard from Agile Manifesto authors like Jim Highsmith, Kent Beck, and Alistair Cover. We've connected with captains of industry like Michael Carroll from Nationwide Insurance. We've also heard from global Agile titans, including Rashina Hoda from Australia. As we begin to see the glimmers of hope for the end of the pandemic, Agilists continue to respond with resilience. This is a time for transformation. I invite you to join me as we continue to journey together. I'm Sanjeev Augustine, and this is Agile Calvin Sarai. Dean Leffingwell is the co-founder and chief methodologist at Scaled Agile. Dean is an entrepreneur who's best known for creating the Scaled Agile framework for the enterprise or SAFE, as it is well known and commonly known in the industry. Dean has a long history of entrepreneurship, having founded several startups, including Requisite Inc., which was eventually acquired by Rational. Dean's also the author of several foundational books, including Agile Software Requirements, Scaling Software Agility, and most recently, Safe Distilled, which really brings uh, Safe down to something that is very understandable and accessible. Today, Dean continues to evolve Safe's knowledge base of proven best practices, and he and his team at Scaled Agile help bring the benefits of software agility and lean thinking to some of the largest software organizations in the world. Dean Leffingwell. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join me. Thanks, Sanjeev. Thanks for asking me. It's been 20 years since the Agile movement started, and of course, we just celebrated the uh, signing of the manifesto in February. Now, you've certainly been involved with Agile and have driven um, uh, many of the Agile sort of forefront, if you will, especially with the Scaled Agile framework over the past 20 plus years. Um, What are some of your reflections looking backward over our Agile history? Well, I'm certainly thankful for that pivotal moment. I mean, we still teach the Agile Manifesto as is, right? We didn't edit it or say it. We've updated it. Um, It's it's integral to what we do. It's uh, I I joined this point of view or this movement, if you will, because I was able to use Agile and coaching some smaller teams, you know, 20 and 30 person teams. And frankly, it was so different than anything I had experienced that I decided myself, I never wanted to work in a format where I wasn't part of an Agile team. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I, 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 I like about what I'm doing now, I love about my job is that, is that the, the, the Scaled Agile Framework team is one team of many in Scaled Agile, but it is a team. And we have all the, you know, the warts and foibles and fun of a team. And, and honestly, working with that team is a great pleasure. Mm-hmm. And when a team reaches a certain kind of performance, they don't want to go back. Right. So That's if we ask people in your audience, you know, if you're on an Agile team, how many want to not be on an Agile team again? It's, it's you know, that, that those days are over. So it's a better way of working. And when I, when I, when I found it in 2002 or 2003, maybe 2004 or so, I came to the conclusion, this is a better way of working, period. So it wasn't a fad or a trend or a label. It was this way of working will absolutely influence the industry. And because my interest is in building big, hard things, right? Big systems that go bump in the night, you know, I'm aerospace engineer and systems engineer. And I, you know, I was, Sputnik was on the air when I was, when I was 10 years old. And I said, that's for me. Well, I wanted to apply it at scale. So for me, it was the manifesto created a team dynamic that was great, but would we deny that same team dynamic to a large enterprise? Or, or is, is it, is, are those teams really, are they, do they have autonomy? Or are they autonomous? And what's the difference? And that became the fascinating puzzle that became safe. I'll also say that I reached my own anniversary. I've now been more, I've been agile, hopefully, m- longer than I wasn't. So when we think about the, the trend here and we think, Sanji, we think this is all still new. It's really not, right? This is 20 years now that, that I've kind of labored this way. Mm-hmm. Fascinating, fun, and by the way, still really hard. Yeah. 
Thanks for that insight, Dean. And uh, as you say, there's uh, it's not new at all. There's uh, there's that phrase, not, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the precursors to the agile methodologies of today was in Evo developed in the 1960s. And then all of the, our stuff has its roots in the, the lean movement. So uh, not, not to mention the scientific method of plan, do, check, act. I, I mean, what is a sprint? <laughs> plan together, execute together, check your work and take action. So it isn't new, but I think the framing in new terms and, and, and the need to get away from things that we used to think were sacrosanct like a big fat requirement specification. So PDCA isn't new, but but a single cycle of PDCA of a big waterfall project, well, that's not really, that's one big fat experiment and big fat experiments never go well. So I think Agile gave us a kind of return to basics focus and also gave us a team thing. So I worked in waterfall, I worked in RUP. I don't ever remember a definition of a team. Yeah. I'll, I'll... And, and Agile defines that. I think Scrum defines that pretty crisply. Even, even XP doesn't have a, a strong definition of that. But when you figure out that, you know, 10 or 12 people, 6, 8 people, that's the unit that you can build with. That's an insight. And then I think some of the simplifications, like the simplification in Scrum of defining the product on the Scrum role, the, the, the simplifications in XP, which is focus on the code, right. focus on delivery, those taken together are pretty powerful. So I've spent really the last 15 years of my career using those things at scale. Right. I appreciate you calling out the human factor side of it. And that's actually a great segue into my second question, which is um, we've been all in this uh, sort of crazy world that we're living in with the pandemic for the last uh, 15 to 16, uh, 15, I guess, months or so. How are you personally doing in the pandemic? Well, thanks for asking. So I'm surviving and thriving. And it's, it's, there's two kind of fascinating elements the team that I work with was already distributed. We have people uh, from UK to West Coast and, and everywhere in between. So it actually didn't change our way of working, but the company wasn't. And we had a, a critical mass of people that we could bring the team in. We did our PI planning face-to-face. -face. So we had this collective process where we created the social relationships that we thrive on as individuals. Right. And, and also just from a, from a macro perspective, those social relationships are how we build systems. We can't build systems by writing a piece of code and throwing it over the wall or, or ignoring a thermal spec for a power supply that has a microprocessor in it. So I'm doing okay because my team functions that way. I'm also doing okay because I got to tell you, I've got enough flight miles on my rear. I don't need to do that again. And yet I'm now feeling the pain. Um, I attended my first meeting with a customer just, just last week and they had about 80 people together and the team building and the esprit de corps and I miss that. And as I mentioned in kind of the pre-interview, I think we're working off the goodwill of a lot of relationships and we're not reestablishing the new ones. So I think it's good that that era has come to an end. And now we have to find a balance where we can still, you know, some people need to be home at five o'clock. That's totally fine. Some people want to walk their dog during the day. That's fine too. At the same time, we have to, we have to reestablish the connective tissue, which is person to person, human to human, you know, trusted relationship to trusted relationship. Number one, that's how we function best as a society. And honestly, as a systems engineer, I don't know how to build systems without that. Without people. Well, which is a perfect and a wonderful segue into my third question is, as we look towards this next normal, and we're blessed in here in the United States, at least, where the vaccines have created a, a fair degree of uh, safety, even if, you know, there's uh, uh, unvaccinated uh, people are still exposed to the uh, to the uh, virus and such, but we're um, you know things are starting to resume and going going back to that in person uh, interaction that you're talking about and giving us the opportunity to rebuild that social uh, tissue, if you will, the connective tissue. So, what is your advice as we go forward and as we take agile out to a new generation of agilists and to the current and past generation of agilists as well, as we go to the next um, uh, next so, normal? What's your so Advice is too strong, too strong a term, but we have to be able to support both sets of needs, right? I think that people are more distributed than they were. I mean, here's a here's the only good thing I can think about about the pandemic is it it got everybody over the notion that you can't be agile unless you're co-located. Yeah. Done with that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so you can yeah. now co-location is still better, but but the 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 opportunity to take you know really bright knowledge workers that can work from anywhere and say, you're gonna, we're gonna recruit you and you have to live within 15 minutes of Boulder, those days are gone. 
And yet many of us thirst for that contact. I, I saw a little, uh, basically a blog this morning. I remember the source. It was like, people are going to go to, you know, three days in the office and two at home. I don't know what they're going to go to. I'm sure what we're going to go to is as much kind of central focus as we can, because we have a lot of people in Boulder. And then PI planning is going to be our anchor tenant. Mm -hmm. As soon as it's safe, we will absolutely do face-to-face -face PI planning quarterly. Because the, the, the learning osmosis, the lunch conversations, the, I'm, hi, I'm Dean, pleased to meet you. Yeah. You can't, there's no, it doesn't work in Zoom. You can't do that. So uh, our model will be hybrid. We'll be less centrally located than we were, but we will support and, and probably, you know, insist that we're together from time to time. And PI planning is just a good quarterly cadence for that. So that's what we're going to do. What you guys should do. I have no clue. I think it's context dependent, right? What are you going to do? Uh, we're going to do the same. You know, we, we we want to preserve some of the lessons and the things that we learned during the pandemic, which is the time to take off for ourselves, not to be sort of cra crazily jet setting from one place to the other and spend a little more time uh, just reflecting and enjoying life. But uh, for any agilist and for people in general, we're social beings. You know, we need that connection. We need that in person not just for for uh, ourselves, but for our customers and for our friends and our families. So uh, we're trying to do, do a mindful mix of in-person and virtual slash hybrid, you know, that, that sort of hybrid. So. I think there's another element here, which is that for knowledge workers, work is a huge part of life, right? So we're not in a situation where we dread going back to that job. Yeah. Right. And there are jobs like that. We're just, we're just the fortunate ones, the white, white collar people. We want to work, and some of us have trouble, you know, separate, se separating vocation from avocation. I certainly do. Mm -hmm. I have my teammates are better at that than I am, but but work is what we want to do. So we want to work. We want to work with people. This is a big part of our life. That's not to say we don't have an equivalent, equally interesting home life. But if you take work away from us, we're not happy beings. Yeah, absolutely. It, there, work for us brings meaning and purpose, and we're blessed to be able to. Uh, have that privilege actually because there's a lot of work that is a uh, grind and horrible and ours we're just blessed to be in positions that we we our work can bring meaning and purpose into our lives so on that happy note uh, dean i want to thank you for your time over here and i really You're welcome you joining me thanks for having me